In this lesson, we'll discuss big idea number one. How does the structure of an atom determine the physical and chemical properties of an element? And focus specifically on learning target number four, explaining the trends on the periodic table. Here's the note we'll be discussing today, trends in the periodic table. As we go through the first part on periodic law, let's have a look at, it, at the periodic table directly. The periodic table was set up to be a cheat sheet for scientists. Depending on where an element is on the periodic table, you can get a whole lot of information about that element if you know the patterns. The periodic law describes the fact that the chemical and physical properties of the elements repeat in a regular pattern when the elements are arranged by atomic number. Now the periodic table is divided into periods and groups, or also known as families. Periods are the rows on the periodic table that go horizontally. So on your periodic table, this row is labeled P1 for period 1, P2, P3, P4, and so on. The period number tells you a code system. What it does is it tells you how many shells of electrons the elements have. So all elements in period number two have two shells of electrons. We can calculate that by looking at lithium. It's got two in the first, one in the second shell. Or fluorine. It's got two in the first and seven in the second shell. If we have a look at sodium, it's got three shells of electrons. With 11 electrons, it would have two in the first, eight in the second, and one in the third. So that's why it's in period three. Groups on the periodic table are the vertical columns. These are also known as chemical families. The group number found at the top of the column indicates how many valence electrons the element has. Now, if you end up with a double-digit group number, like carbon, is, for example, is in group number 14, you just take the second digit to get the number of valence electrons. Now the number of valence electrons dictates what reactions that an element can do and how it reacts with other things. So every chemical in the same group have similar chemical properties. Certain groups have special names and you learn some of these in grade 9 so let's review them. Group number 1 is known as the alkali metals. These are metals that react really vigorously with water and make bases. Group number two are called the alkaline earth metals. They also react with water and make bases, and they're found more available on earth than the group one metals. Group number 17 are known as the halogens. Now, they're very reactive non-metals, and all of them are actually poisonous to life. If you think about it, we add fluorine to tap water to help kill bacteria on our teeth. We use chlorine to disinfect things. We use bromine or bromine in hot tubs and pools. We use iodine on cuts to disinfect them. And the last group are no that you need to know the name of are the group 18. These are the noble gases. They're called the noble gases because they're not reactive with other chemicals. These elements already have a full outer valence shell of electrons. You'll need to memorize these group names so that when you come across the names and questions in this class, you'll be able to recognize what elements are being discussed. Now let's have a look at some more trends. Some new patterns for grade 11 are atomic radius, ionization energy, electron affinity, and electronegativity. Now all four of these patterns or trends can be explained by looking at how strongly the valence electrons are attracted to the nucleus. This force of attraction is known as the effective nuclear charge, or ZEF for short. The effective nuclear charge of an atom 
it is affected by two main forces, the first being electron repulsion. Because electron shells contain electrons, which are all negative, they repel each other because they are the same charge. The more sh electron shells in between the nucleus and the valence electrons, the less attracted the valence electrons are to the atom. The second force is known as proton attraction. Because the nucleus is positively charged overall due to, due to the amount of protons, it has an opposite charge attraction to the, all the electrons on the atom. The more protons an atom has, pulling on the same number of electron shells, the more attracted the valence electrons are to the atom. Now notice here in the definition that if we're comparing two elements, the proton attraction only has a dramatic effect if your two elements you're comparing have the same number of electron shells. So overall, the effect of nuclear charge can be calculated by using this math equation. You take the proton attraction, how strongly are the, is the nucleus pulling on the valence electrons, and subtract that from the electron repulsion to get the effective nuclear charge of the atom. Now we won't actually throw numbers into this equation and get a value for the effective nuclear charge, but what we can do is use this concept to explain some other patterns that we see on the periodic table. If we're comparing two elements, we can check out which one has more electron repulsion, which one would have more proton attraction, and explain some of the patterns of atomic radius and electronegativity. So let's look at the atomic radius. Radius is defined as the distance from the center of the atom to its boundary within which the electrons travel, so the outside valence shell. Now before we discuss what's going on, let's draw a couple of Bohr diagrams. Here I've drawn some modified Bohr diagrams showing how many protons and where the electrons are in their shells. Pause the video here and complete the diagrams on your note. There are two patterns for atomic radius, and the second one listed in the note is easier to wrap your head around, so let's talk about that one first. As you go down the vertical groups of the periodic table, such as comparing lithium, sodium, and potassium, the atoms get smaller. This is because there's more electron repulsion. So lithium has got two shells of electrons, where sodium has got three. The more electron shells in between the valence electron in the nucleus, the more ER there is, and the further this valence shell is pushed out into 3D space, making sodium a bigger atom. The same thing can be said for potassium. It has four shells of repulsion, so that its valence shell sticks out further. The second pattern for atomic radius is a little counterintuitive. As you move across a period in the periodic table, from the left to the right, your atoms get smaller. Here, if we compare lithium, beryllium, and fluorine, we see that effect. Notice first that each of these elements is in the same period. That means each element has two electron shells. That means that all of those atoms have the same electron repulsion. So it's really the proton attraction that sets up this trend. If we compare the number of protons in the nucleus, here we have three protons in lithium pulling on two shells. In beryllium, we have four protons pulling on the same number of shells. Beryllium's nucleus can pull stronger. That means its valence shell is pulled in closer to the center of the atom and beryllium is a smaller atom. 
the same thing can be said for fluorine. Fluorine is actually a very small atom because it's got nine protons pulling on two shells. On the class periodic table, we put these arrows in the top corner to remind you the direction of the trend. For radius, atoms get larger as you go down the table and to the left. Here are some example questions for you to try. If we give you some elements, you should be able to list them from smallest to largest. A more difficult question would be, if we give you two elements, we could ask you to compare their structures, tell us which one is larger, and using proper terminology, explain why. Pause the video and try these out. In the first set of elements, the largest one is sodium, because it is the furthest one down in the table and the furthest to the left. In the second set of elements, calcium is the biggest for the same reason.